Say treat that as a different 
um, yeah, these are all arbitrary options because this is just uh, yeah, treat that as a different case. But uh, in general, when you make assumptions, write what they are because depending on your assumptions, of course, your answers change. So uh, in that specific case, I would say once two parts are broken, then assume they cannot be joined back together. Other questions? I would say start the VC dimension question soonish because uh, uh, it could be tricky or not. I don't know. Uh, also, uh, there's a project related uh, deadline. Uh, there's an intermediate status report that's due now. I understand the irony of calling it intermediate status and putting it so close to the end of the semester, uh, but that's what it is. Um, it's due number 15, and uh, uh, depending on what kind of project you have, uh, what you have to do uh, differs. So for, uh, let's start with the exploratory project first. For the exploratory, pro sorry, let's start with the regular, I don't know what's the difference. Let's call this the uh, Let's start with the Kaggle project first, uh, the competitive thing. I think you have to fix that. Oh, I mixed it up. <laughs> <laughs> in, in either case, let's start with the capital project. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, you're right. Uh, so, uh, in that case, you need to have submitted two non trivial runs to Kaggle. So, this could be any two, you know, the results of any two learning algorithms that we've covered in class by then. So, by then, we would have covered. Uh, well, today we finished support vector machine. Maybe it's just a little bit left over. Um, you would have a Zephron, you would have a decision trees, but keep in mind training decision trees on this data set could be a bit tricky. Uh, some of you tried it and uh, ran into some computational issues. Um, so you have to think about other tricks like you know sampling features or something. You could do bad decision stumps, for example, you could do random forests. Um, anyway, you should have submitted two non-trivial runs to Kaggle. Um, what I'll do when I'm grading that is I'll just check for the timestamp on the submissions and see what they are. One suggestion, uh, just to make my life a little bit simpler while grading, is when you submit something on Kaggle, see if you can, uh, I think it allows you to submit a comment on what algorithm was used. Uh, so please use that just to make it simpler. Uh, in addition to that, you also need to submit a report. Um, please do, don't make the report more than two pages long. Um, you don't have to write too much. All you have to do is uh, talk about any sort of pre-processing that you may have done. You're allowed to do feature transformations. This is just like uh, open season. You can do whatever you want. If you if you choose to do feature transformations, what they are. Uh, talk about what you may have tried that did not work. What you may have tried that works. Describe the two algorithms that you submitted. And what you plan to do for the Rest of the semester. All of this should fit into pages. Um, it could just be bullet points, for example. Uh, I don't particularly care for the quality of the rows and stuff. I mean, I just need to know what you did. Um, so, just to summarize, if you are doing the competitive project, also known as the Kaggle project, uh, you need to have submitted two non trivial runs. You, ne you need to write a report detailing what you did, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and uh, a suggestion is, um, oh, in your report you should also describe what algorithm you used and any implementation issues that you may have faced. Uh, the suggestion is when you submit something on Kaggle, please tag the submission with a short description of what algorithm you used or why you submitted it. Okay, so that's about the competitive project. Any questions? Yes. On your website, is it that the, the notification media report should be no uh, maybe at most two pages. Uh, at least two pages was written at a time when I was ambitious and I had dreams of reading all 160 of them. Uh, now I'm older and wiser. <laughs> so at most. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Should we be trying to do uh, feature transformation? Is that, uh, is that something you expect to see? Uh, I expect you to see, I expect to see anything, something interesting, anything. 
Uh, this is the reason why the project is slightly more open-ended. It's not a homework where I tell you what to do. Uh, the project is meant to simulate a kind of situation that you might encounter when you apply machine learning out in the wild. You may have data, um, and someone comes to you and says, you know, I heard you're an expert on machine learning. Go learn my machine. So everything's open, right? Um, and that's the point here. I mean, um, when you have to use these ideas in any sort of real application, you don't know what's going to work. You need to kind of try out things and you need to kind of explore. And even though this is not an exploratory project, there is an exploration aspect to it. And one of the things that I hope you learn from the project is uh, how much of an art there is in machine learning. Uh, even though we have all this rigorous math, the rigorous math only talks about a tiny part of it. There's a whole amount of you know, design to it where you have to figure out what is interesting. And that's where you, it helps to know what the task is. So keep in mind, I've just given you one feature set. Maybe one possibility is you could choose to reach, I've also given you the raw data. You could choose to read the raw data, extract your own features that have nothing to do with the features that I have. And that's a perfectly valid thing to do because who says I got the right feature? Right? So yeah, everything's uh, uh, a lot. The only constraint, of course, is that if we, if uh, you have to have five algorithms that we covered in class, and any algorithm we covered in class, you should implement by yourself. Other questions about the competitive project? So regarding the exploratory project, I'm still a little behind on reading all your, uh, the, 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 what do you call them, the project proposals, uh, sadly, but I've spoken to many of you, and in most cases, it seems like uh, the answer is go. Um, I, there are a few more that I have to get to. Some students tried to meet me at, in office hours here last Tuesday, or the day before yesterday, I couldn't get to that. But anyway, I'll get back to you within the next couple of days. And uh, uh, in most cases, the, the answer is you, the project proposal looks good, go ahead. Uh, but here is a, sort of a, uh, a, a milestone. The goal of this milestone is to kind of force yourself into doing something. And the something should not be just we have some data. It should be we did something non trivial. So, what I would like you to do in the report by the time the report is due is you need to have some, done something non trivial that's related to machine learning, uh, which means that it can't be just we managed to get our hands on the data and in the next two weeks we're going to do everything else. Uh, so, you describe the data, describe the task, describe any progress that you, have, you may have made, uh, any design choices that you may have made. For example, if, uh, as a hypothetical example, let's say you pick a project that involves uh, 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 predicting something, uh, it doesn't matter. In a hypothetical project, project uh, you, you maybe know about the domain and you have some sense of these are good features and maybe you've done some feature extraction and you've done some baselines. The baselines could be, if it's a classification task, uh, what is the accuracy of the majority classifier? What's the accuracy <coughs> of some classifier that you found uh, in your homeworks and you ran on uh, data? Uh, many of you are working on very interesting problems that maybe I'm not totally familiar with. So introduce the problem. Uh, uh, point to any relevant literature. Maybe you're the first person to work on the problem ever, but quite likely not. So what has what have other people done? Are other solutions also machine learning solutions? If not, why not? Why do you think we need machine learning? Or are, are, are other solutions also machine learning solutions? And if so, why is that? You know, what is what is known? What what is solved? So explain the task to me. Uh, tell me about what uh, uh, you have done. Give me some sense of the difficulty of the problem. One way of measuring the difficulty of a problem is to uh, get some sort of a majority classifier baseline and maybe some sort of a simple classifier with simple features. Um, or if it's a regression problem, a simple regressor with simple features. And uh, we'll wrap up this report with some sort of a, a plan for what you're going to do with the rest of the 
rest of the semester is really just another month. So what's your plan for the rest of the semester? How do you plan to go by it? And uh, many of the, uh, not many, but some of the exploratory projects are uh, in a group of two people. So just so that I understand who does what, in this uh, stage, I want you to kind of tell me how you're going to split the responsibilities so that I know who does what. Okay, any questions? Yes. Um, so we're expected to be using the algorithms like we've set up ourselves. Are, right, are we allowed to kind of make <coughs> add the, a more add the box? Uh, so I would, or something I like would that. like you to do both. Uh, um, so, for example, there are some people working on exploratory projects which are quite um, challenging, let's say, if you have to implement everything from scratch. And in those cases, like, uh, I, would ex I would not expect you to implement. For example, some of you might be working on some sort of a fancy neural network thing. But what I would like you to do is, uh, if you want to do a fancy neural network thing, do a, use a library, but also show me why you need the fancy neural network. You know, apply something silly, something stupid. Show me that it doesn't work. So, uh, one of the things is, you know, if you should not have complexity unless you need it. So, show me why the simple thing doesn't work. And the simple thing could be something that you implemented from class. Decision three, you know, ID three is not the, uh, let's say, it's not the greatest decision tree algorithm out there, but it's pretty good. Uh, the fancier things built on top of this, so try out ID3, see what happens. Compare it to a decision tree learner from, uh, of, you know, of, of the shelf, and see what's uh, wrong. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'm going to move on. Just a quick reminder for those who may have shown up late, there's a homework on number 13. There are project reports due on uh, the 15th. Uh, I spoke a lot about project reports. I'm sure somebody, I'm sure the video got it. So you can look it up. Alright, so we're going to get back to our regular program. Um, namely, we're going to continue where we left off with support vector machines. Just a quick recap of what we saw. Um, uh, the story started with the observation that. Uh, Reducing VC dimension can improve generalization. If only you were able to find a classifier that had low VC dimension, among all classifiers that were equal in terms of, say, training error, the one with the lowest VC dimension is the best. Then the, there's this theorem from Vapnik that says for uh, linear classifiers, the VC dimension is uh, varies inversely as the margin of the classifier. This gives a concrete strategy for finding uh, the best, defining the best linear classifier, which in the separable case, this is what we call the hard SPN, the separable case, um, we have the learning objective of finding uh, a linear classifier that maximizes the margin, because maximizing the margin corresponds to lower VC dimension, and lower VC dimension gives you better generalization. So among all linear classifiers that separate the data, find the one that maximizes the margin. Now that can prove to be a slightly uh, tricky optimization problem to solve. So through some sort of uh, uh, clever analysis, uh, we arrived at an equivalent thing, which is maximize in the margin is equivalent to saying, uh, I want to minimize the norm of W such that for every training example, Y W transpose X is at least one. So, if y w transpose x for the closest example is equal to 1, then maximizing the margin is exactly the same as minimizing the norm of w. So this gives us an optimization problem. Minimize the norm of w, subject to the constraint, and I haven't talked about how to solve this optimization problem, but we have the problem. Minimize the norm of w, subject to the constraint that for every training example, x, y, that we have from the training set, y w transpose x is more than 1. So this was the hardest way. Now, this leads to some sort of a problem because we need uh, separable data for this to work and we know that uh, real data uh, tends not to be separable. So this is a problem because the constraint that for every example y w transpose x should be at least one 
is not going to be satisfied, which means we are going to be left with an empty set of weight vectors among which we find the one that minimizes the norm of W. So the, the learning program crashes. So this is, we have what is called an increasable optimization problem. In order to address this, we introduced this, uh, we saw this idea called the uh, flag variable. Flag variables are essentially saying there are these constraints here, but maybe I'm going to allow every example to violate the constraint by some xi i. That's the Greek letter xi. Xi yi will violate the constraint by xi i. So, which means what we get is uh, instead of y w transpose x should be greater than 1, we get y w y i, let's say, w transpose x i is greater than or equal to 1 minus psi i. And if psi i is positive, that means if it's totally fine if the, the data set is not linearly separable because I'm going to find a large psi i, which means we're going to get a negative y w transpose x. That example will not get classified correctly, but it's okay. So that's the intuition here of the slack variable. So the slack variables allow the margin constraint to be violated, and this uh, sets up our um, optimization problem for SVM, which is the thing on top. So we're going to minimize the no over not just the norm of W, but the, uh, sorry, we're going to minimize not just over the Ws, but also all the size. So Ws, if you have B, M, B features, W is a vector in Rb. If you have M examples, um, then with psi i, you'll have M, uh, each example corresponds to one psi i, so you'll have M of these things. So you're going to minimize over all of these. What we had in the soft SPM was just minimize the norm of W, half norm of W, half W transpose W. But now we're going to say minimize half W transpose W plus the total slack, the sum of all the size, um, such that for every example, y w transpose x is at least 1 minus i i, where the size are positive. Uh, this is roughly where we left off, and we're going to kind of uh, <coughs> stare at this a bit and see what it means. So, the first term, min, uh, minimizing the norm of w, is the same thing as before. It, minimizing the norm of w gives us larger margins. The second term, the sum of the slack, says uh, try to find the largest margin, but don't allow these constraints to be the, the margin constraint to be violated a lot. We still want our data set to be separated. So if the size were all infinity, for example, the first constraint here is all trivially true. If the size are all allowed to be infinity. So essentially what we are saying is I don't want the margin constraint to be violated. Allow the you know allow violations, but I prefer that not to happen. So there are these two terms, there's maximizing the margin and the second term that says uh, I want to still classify the data training set correctly. These are both, com these may end up being competing objectives because if I don't care about maximizing the margin, um, I can allow, I, I, I am allowing the classifier to overfit the training set. If I don't care about the size, uh, you know, if I don't, um, let me just erase a few things because I feel like I'm going to keep drawing the same arrows again. Uh, if I don't care about maximizing the margin, this term disappears, which means only the second term shows up, which means I want to minimize the uh, second term, which means I want to make the psi i as small as possible, and that happens when you overfit the data. Uh, you try hard to find every, classify every example correctly because. If the psi i is zero, that means every example is correctly classified. So essentially, if the second term only shows up and the first term does not, you it, it, it ends up like it overfitting the data. Now, if the first term only shows up and the second one does not, that's exactly what we had before. Actually, no, it's not. If the first term only shows up and the second term does not, that is, I don't care about the data. Find whatever size work. In fact, if if you want, make the size infinity. Making the size infinity says that constraint here essentially is trivially true because the left hand side becomes negative infinity. So that says, you know, here's a data set, find a classifier 
but you're free to ignore the data set if you want. <laughs> right? Because the second term basically asks the optimizer to fit the data. So essentially, the first term favors generalization, the second term favors uh, overfitting. But neither of these are good because overfitting is bad, but underfitting is also bad. Ignoring the data set is bad. We still want to classify and fit the data. So both of these things we need in some amounts, and that introduces this extra parameter C. C is like this trade-off parameter. It's a hyperparameter. C is something that we set before we start training somehow actually producing cross validation, and that lets us control overfitting versus underfitting. So it gives us this one sort of a knob to tune between these two extremes. Now, uh, this sort of an optimization problem, that everything above the line that I'm drawing right now, that is a standard uh, SVM optimization problem. And this is roughly how uh, it used to be uh, solved even until about, say, the mid-2000s. Um, there were a few people who were doing different things, but you know, this is basically a convex optimization problem. We'll get to that later today. But uh, it turns out you can kind of simplify things, and I'm not going to talk about uh, the details of the simplification, but really the observation is this inequality here is exactly the same as psi i is greater than or equal to 1 minus psi i w transpose i. I just moved the psi and y's on the other side. Now, let's look at these two things together. The first one says psi i should be greater than 1 minus y w transpose x. The second one says psi should be greater than 0. We want both of these to be true, which means psi should be greater than the bigger of those two. Right? So what that means is psi i is greater than or equal to max, okay, I'm not going to write it because I have it here, greater than max of 0 and 1 minus y w transpose x. Now, through a little bit of uh, you know, squinting, essentially what we can do is if psi i is greater than both of these, we can replace the psi in the objective with the max term. And now, and we, we can get rid of all the constraints because we don't have the psi anymore. We have essentially eliminated the psi. So that gives us this unconstrained optimization problem, which I'm going to argue is more interpretable, and I'm going to talk about why it's more interpretable. This is where I, uh, we stop at the end of uh, Tuesday's lecture. Are there questions? There must be questions, right? Yes? So when it says min 90, does it mean like min more than a whole string? Or just min like per string of one string? Sorry? Uh, On the second equation? Oh, right, here? Oh, it's minimized the, over the whole objective. The objective, let me erase out some of the lines so that uh, I can redraw them. So the objective is this whole thing. So we have some function over w's and minimize that function, uh, find the smallest value of that function, and you are allowed to explore all possible values of that. Yes. The size. Your, your size could be less than zero. No, that we by definition we do not want them to be less than zero. So if you could quantify something correctly, your size could be less than zero. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But then you end up then you set the size to negative infinity, that gives you a minimum. Right? <coughs> the if you set the size all the size to be negative infinity, if the size are allowed to be negative then might as well set them to negative infinity, the term on top becomes, uh, the objective becomes negative infinity um, for a linearly separable data set, I mean, for a linearly separable data set. So you don't want that. The interpretation of the psi as breaking into the margin means they are allowed, to, the, the points are allowed to travel only in one direction. So that's how the flat variables are defined. Allowing the slash to be, uh, the size to be negative gives us nothing. Or rather, it doesn't give us anything more than what we had before. Yeah? So, on the same point, you, so there's no, it does not make sense to have a stack, right? Or things which are. Already classified. 
Yes. Uh, it ends up being, the psi ends up being zero. For those variables which are correctly classified, the slack ends up being zero because it's already classified. There's no reason to have a slack. And it's not, in the optimizer, from the optimization point of view, you can think of it this way. Let's say you have an example that's correctly classified. Let's say we have an example x0 and y0 that's correctly classified. And let's say the slack for that, for psi 0, for, the, uh, for argument sake, you believe that the slack for that should be equal to, say, half. Not 0. It's correctly classified and you believe it's going to be half. What I would argue is if it's correctly classified, then, then w transpose x0, y0 is greater than or equal to 1 minus half. Right? Instead of making it 1 minus half, I will multiply this whole thing by a half and that makes this greater than 1. So then I have another w, which is half w of half the original thing. So let me just do this more correctly. So if you know what, let's take this offline. Simple answer, um, the, if, the, if, if you, for a correctly classified example, the slack is not zero, if you believe that, then what I could do is find an equivalent decision function for which the slack is zero. And because the slack is, because the objective gives me some points if the slack is minimized, uh, my rule will be better from the objective one. Yes. Could you also say that you can just ignore those because they don't affect the margin, where the margin finally ends up? Essentially, yes. Okay. If they are on the under, they are on the margin. Right. Yes. But even then, they would be zero. Their slack would be zero. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, it turns out this whole thing is easier to interpret. The thing in the box is somewhat easier to interpret. So, let's kind of stare at that a bit. Uh, what we have is this objective function that contains two terms. So, by objective function, so those of you who may not have taken an optimization class, uh, the general idea is we have some function f, uh, which is a function of some variables, let's call them in this case f of w, w is a vector, and our goal is to minimize or maximize over the space of all w's, uh, find the value of this function that is smallest. This whole thing is called the objective in the optimization problem. In this case, the objective is uh, this thing here. So, uh, yes? Isn't f also a function of x and y? x and y are constants. We are given a data set. Okay. We have a data set. Okay. So, x and y is are constants. The only thing that the learning algorithm is allowed to control is the w. Thankfully, the learning algorithms, you would agree, it's a good thing that learning algorithms don't mess with the data. <laughs> yes. yes. So, the only thing that we get to control is the model. So, we have an objective that is the sum of two things. It's the sum of, the first term is the norm of the W, and the second term is the sum over all examples of max uh, 0, 1 minus y w transpose x. Let's stare at this bit. The first term is we got that from before, uh, it's, the, it's basically equivalent to saying I like uh, uh, the margin to be maximized. You can think of the second term, the thing inside the summation, as the penalty for the prediction that this particular w makes. So, imagine that there is a certain w that we really like, for whatever reason. The thing in the box is the penalty that that particular w has to pay for the example x i y i. Uh, we can consider three things that could happen. Maybe the particular w that we have correctly classifies the example. Not only does it correctly classify the example, it places the point outside the margin. So that means y i w transpose x i is greater than or equal to 1. It places it outside the margin. Which means 1 minus y i i is less than 0, right? Which means the maximizer is actually 0. Which means if the classifier, if the weights that we currently have, that we seem to be are entertaining right now, correctly classifies an example and puts it outside the margin, that particular set of uh, weights gets a penalty <coughs> of 0, which seems like the right thing to do. It's putting the point on the right side of the margin. So it should not be penalized. Okay? 
The other case is also easy, where say the classifier incorrectly classifies the uh, point. It means y i w transpose x i is less than zero. If it's less than zero, one minus y i w transpose x i is clearly greater than zero. Zero is really great, strictly greater than zero, right? Which means in this maximization thing, there are two things that you are comparing. One minus y i w transpose x i is greater than zero, so it wins the maximization. So the penalty that this particular classifier pays for misclassifying example x i y i is equal to how far does it put the point on the wrong side of the hyperplane, which is one minus uh, on the wrong side of the margin, sorry, which is one minus y i w transpose x i. So the penalty of misclassification is the distance from the margin uh, to the uh, point. So that's how. So the farther it puts the point on the wrong side, the more penalty it takes. Now there's a third case, which is the example is classified correctly, but it's put within the margin. Which is essentially saying y i w transpose x i is between zero and one. If it's between zero and one, that means one minus y i w transpose x i is greater than zero. Right? Which means the penalty in the penalty term, you still uh, this term still wins. Which means it's greater than zero, so the classifier has to pay a small penalty for putting points within the margin. So there is an incentive for the classifier not just to classify points correctly, but to put them on the other side of the margin, farther away from the hyperplane, so that we get this sort of a margin of safety. So that the maximum the margin is maximized. <coughs> This penalty term it has a name. This penalty term, the max of 0, 1 minus y w transpose x, has a name. It's called the hinge loss function. You can define it as the hinge loss. I'm going to call it L hinge. It's a function of y and w, uh, y and x and w, and it's defined to be the penalty that the classifier has to pay for misclassifying examples. But not just misclassifying examples, but for putting examples within the margin. If you are a kind of person who likes pictures, here's a pictorial version of the same story. Um, on the horizontal axis, I have y w transpose x. On the vertical axis, I have a loss. Now, y w so what I have here is uh, two curves. Uh, one of them, the red one here, is called the 0, 1 loss. The 0, 1 loss is really what we want to minimize. It's essentially saying, so first of all, if an example is correctly classified, we know that y w transpose x should be greater than or equal to 0. Now, if the example is correctly classified, that means we are in this side of 0. And the number of, the, the, essentially the 0, 1 loss, you can think of it as how many points are taken away if you make a mistake. In 0, 1 loss, it says, on that side of 0, no mistakes, are made, so no points are taken away. On this side of zero, there's one mistake for this example, so you lose one point. So it's really, how many points are taken away? There's one point on this side and zero points on that side. So it's really capturing accuracy, or error, if you want. What we would like to do in an ideal world is to find a classifier that minimizes the zero one loss. Now, zero one loss, unfortunately, is uh, not even a continuous function. So we don't know how to optimize this. We don't know how to optimize this. In fact, uh, there are theorems that show that optimizing zero one loss is intractable. So what we need to do is to discover surrogates for this particular optimization problem. One of the many, many, many surrogates for this is called the hinge loss. The hinge loss is this term here. As a function of uh, you know y w transpose x, it's really saying so. Yeah, let's go here. So the zero one loss, first of all, if the sign of y and w transpose x is the same, the penalty is one. If the sign of y and w transpose x is different, the penalty is zero. Before we move into analyzing the hinge loss, are there any questions about the zero one loss? We will revisit this at least once, possibly as early as next week, but uh, 
This is an important concept that I want you to kind of internalize. So the 0, 1 loss is essentially asking how many points should be taken away whenever there's a mistake. And what's a mistake? A mistake is when the signs of y and w transpose x are not the same. So if the signs are the same, if on this side <coughs> no points are taken away, on this side uh, you take away one point. Okay? The hinge loss is uh, sort of a surrogate for that, which um, you can convince yourself that if you plot uh, max of 0 and 1 minus yw transpose x, the x axis, the horizontal axis is yw transpose x, you'll get this curve, and this is the uh, hinge, and it consists of three regions. <coughs> On essentially, the hyper, think of it as this way the hyperplane sits here. This is the hyperplane, and this is the margin. Uh, because we are multiplying by y, we have only one side. Both the negatives and the positives essentially fold over. On this region, on the correct side of the margin, there is no penalty. The penalty is zero, just like the zero-one loss. In this region, where there is actually a misclassification, the penalty keeps growing as you keep going farther away on the wrong side. It grows linearly. And there's this region here where if I put a point here, let's say I put a point here, that means y w transpose x is positive. It's more than zero, which means that example was correctly classified, but because we are trying to be believe in this philosophy of maximizing the margin, we are not happy because we look at it and say, you know, it's right, but I'd have been happier if it was here. So you still have a penalty. How much? This one. Because you made a, you did not make a mistake, but you put a, or I say you, but I'm talking to the classifier here. Mm -hmm. uh, it put the class, it put the point within the margin, so that's not good. That leads the margin to be small, which means it kind of uh, uh, hurt generalization. Questions about the hinge loss? No, actually, we don't have any algorithms that minimize the zero one loss um, because it's intractable. Yes. Isn't the penalty actually equivalent to the y that's in the x? Because the closer you get to the y, when you say y, you mean the vertical axis? Right. Yes, that's right. Sorry, I thought you said that the farther that point moved to the right. Yeah, the farther the, po oh, okay. to the left, the farther the point moves to the left, let me erase all the annotations I made. The farther you move on this side, the more the penalty goes. Right, I'm talking about the hinge loss. Yeah, even in the hinge loss. This is the hinge loss. Right. I just misunderstood. When you drew that red line that's in the middle of the hinge loss, you said that. I thought you said that. Oh, no, that's the, think of that as a hyperplane. Imagine that the hyperplane is sitting there to get a sense of which side is wrong. Yes. Or rather the folded version of the hyperplane, so that both positives and negatives are on that side. Okay. So just to quickly summarize this thing, the hinge loss consists really tries to simultaneously capture three cases where um, misclassifications are penalized, correct predictions have no penalty. But even predictions that put points within the margin are penalized. And the penalty in both cases is 1 minus y w transpose x. Okay? Now, again, I want to kind of uh, go up a bit. Look at the objective function. It consists of two parts. That is the first term, which says, I don't care about the data. Like the first term does not even have any term, anything involving the x's and the y's. It says, I don't care about the data. I have a certain preference for weight vectors, 
In the absence of any information, I want to find weight vectors that are as close to the origin as possible. Because minimizing the norm of W is saying I want to make all the values of W close to zero. Because zero would be the absolute minimizer. So in the absence of any data, I have a preference for finding small weight vectors. That's what the first term says. And the important point is it's a function that, is, that does not require any uh, data. The second term says, I don't care about generalization yet. All I care about is to penalize mistakes. And I want to penalize every mistake that the classifier makes. And in, in this case, it also penalizes some things that are not mistakes, but it does not directly contribute to generalization. It's just a penalty for misclassification. So there are two terms, and there is the, the, uh, the, the learning pro, uh, algorithm, whatever it is, we have not seen any of the learning algorithms yet, whatever algorithm minimizes this would have to balance these two terms to the extent that C allows. So if C is high, it means I care more about overfitting the data. If C is low, it says, feel free to ignore examples <coughs> if necessary, but I need the, the norm of the W to be small. Now, what's a good C? We don't know. We need to, it depends on the data set and we have to figure out by cross-validation. And you will be doing that in your homework. This general idea, you can kind of uh, generalize this without any math. This is the idea of risk minimization. What we do is we define some notion of loss. Loss is essentially a penalty for misclassification. Usually this loss is uh, defined on a per example basis and the loss on the data is the sum of the losses or the average essentially of losses over the entire training set. So a principle for learning here is find a hypothesis that minimizes loss. Now the risk that you run with this just doing this is you nothing prevents overfitting. A hypothesis that minimizes loss is, for example, one that sets loss to zero would be one that just remembers <coughs> the training set. If it remembers the training set, there are no misclassifications, so it, uh, it minimizes the loss perfect. As a result, we have to augment this principle into what is called regularized risk minimization. I may not have used the word regularizer before. A regularizer is just a function of the hypothesis that may be independent of data that gives a preference for simpler hypotheses. A regularizer essentially embodies Occam's razor. A regularizer says, among all classifiers that seem to work equally well, I'm going to penalize examples by their complex, uh, sorry, hypotheses by their complexity. A regularizer is a penalty for complexity. As a result, it gives better generalization. Right? So we have a regularizer and we have another term which was the loss that we had before. And now the, the, uh, the principle of regularized risk minimization phase, the goal of learning is to find a hypothesis that minimizes the sum of the regularizer and the loss. The regularizer is a term that pushes for generalization. The second term, the empirical loss, push us for fitting the training set, and we need to find a classifier that balances these two things. In the case of SVMs, it turns out that uh, these two terms have a clean separation of duties. The first term is the regularizer, uh, the norm of W, the squared norm of W. is called the regularizer. Um, it's, because it's the squared norm of W, it's called the squared norm regularizer. In this case, what the, this interpretation of the regularizer says, um, minimizing the norm of W maximizes the margin. As a result, it imposes a preference over hypotheses that are equally good. If you have two functions, two classifiers that are equally good, this term says, I prefer a, a classifier that has a lower norm of W. As a result, because of the theorem from Bapnik, uh, it gives better generalization. Of course, this is not the only way of creating a regularizer. There are other regularizers that exist. There's a whole cottage industry of regularizers. This is just, in my opinion, probably the most common one that you'll see. You could have other things like the, you know, one norm 
makes norms and there are data driven type of guidelines, there's a whole bunch. But all of them essentially impose a preference over classifiers. The second term is called the empirical loss. In this case, for support vector machines, the empirical loss is the hinge loss. The hinge loss says, how much do I, well, not just the hinge loss, but in general, all empirical losses penalize classifiers for their mistakes. Or perhaps not even mistakes for properties that are undesirable, like putting points in the mark. It penalizes classifiers for doing something that you don't like. Now, which means, if I put it so vaguely, that means, that suggests that there can be other law functions. And there are. There can be, uh, there's again a whole cottage industry of uh, loss functions where uh, you can replace, swap out the hinge loss with other loss functions and you get other learning algorithms. So the support vector machine, from this perspective, is basically minimizing the regularized hinge loss. By the regularizer, in the traditional definition in support vector machine, is a square norm. And these two terms may sometimes compete with each other in choosing which hypothesis. Maybe the regularizer says, I like this hypothesis. Maybe the empirical law says, I like that hypothesis. Which one do you pick? There is a trade-off hyperparameter that says, what you do is you weigh them by this constant phi, and you pick the one that has the lowest weighted sum. The hyperparameter essentially controls, uh, allows the the, the sort of the user of this, pro, this, uh, class, this learning algorithm to trade off between a large margin, which is the first term, and a small loss, which is the second term, and C gets to decide, your choice of C lets you decide how much you care about each of these. Questions about any of these things? So if you didn't have that C, Yes. In there, uh, we would just sometimes get ties between them, but... No, well, if you don't have the C, that says the C equals 1. Okay. If you don't have the C, C equals 1, that says both are equally important. Right, right, right. So, when we, when we run our algorithm, you know, sometimes it would happen to work and give us something that was... that doesn't have a conflict between the... No, no, what would happen is that's just one choice of C. Uh -huh. uh, it, not having the C is the same as setting C equals 1, C1, yeah. which suggests that both these terms are equally important. Mm -hmm. Now, perhaps that's the right choice for this data set that you have, perhaps it's not. For example, as just an uh, example, in some data sets that I have played with, I usually use cross validation to find C, and when you're doing cross validation for C, it's better to search in uh, degrees or in orders of magnitude, so maybe I search for C in 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and so on. And maybe the best C could be 10 power minus 6. If C is 10 power minus 6, it says this data is so noisy, don't bother trying to overfit it. So higher C basically suggests that the data is linearly separable. Lower C suggests that the data, or not suggest, but basically embodies this belief that, your, you, that the data is not linearly separable. Right, because that's what the, the C is attached to the second term. Other questions? I saw another hand go up, but three people disappeared. You have a question. Okay, you have a question. Okay. Um, and this is, I guess, just kind of forgetting what we did last time. How does the, so finding the norm of W for the first term, I guess um, we did that kind of by, because we, we know we could scale the sign That's right. by anything? Yes. Okay. That's I guess right. how, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused how that implies the, the, as a preference for like so, simplicity. So that goes back, that's like a somewhat subtle but multi-step argument, uh, which goes like this. Like this. So, uh, the first point is from Bachman. No, the first point is not even Bachman. The first point is no VC implies better 
generalization. This is from uh, the agnostic learning and dynamics. The second thing is from Gartnick, who said the VC dimension of uh, a linear classifier with a margin gamma is uh, the minimum of R square or gamma square and B plus one. This means low uh, margin, no sorry, high margin implies low VC, which implies better generalization. Okay, now the third point is what is the margin? The margin is defined to be the uh, what it, 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 basically the distance, it, the distance of the point that's closest to the hyperplane, but minimum among all xi and yi, so the margin of a classifier w is defined to be uh, yi. I'm going to ignore the bias term divided by the norm of w. Right? So we want to maximize this term. But in, in the process of maximizing this term, it turns out that uh, we can basically scale this whole thing however we want. So we can set the scaling term, we can scale this by uh, uh, a, a constant, let's call that k. The constant takes the value of min xi i, but not w, but let's call that uh, uh, u. u is the best weight vector, it's a true weight vector. My u's and w's are the same. <laughs> so let's say v. Now, this is a constant, if we had the two weight factors. Now, I can scale these things, which means, uh, basically, the margin is going to end up, the margin of uh, the classifier ends up being simply 1 over the norm of W, such that, but, but the W is already incorporates the scale, such that Yi uh, V transpose Xi is greater than or equal to 1, because it's the minimum. At optimum, V and W are going to be the same. So, if you're going to frame this as an optimization problem, you can just say minimize over all W, one, or maximize over all W, which is the same as minimize over all W, uh, the norm of W, such that Yi, W transpose Xi is greater than equal to 1. And this gives us the hardest gain. So, it's a rather involved chain of reasoning that brought us to this. And minimizing the norm of W is exactly the same as minimizing the squared norm of W, which is what we have. Hmm. Right? And then getting rid of the, then we introduce slack, and getting rid of the slack and putting the hinge loss in the objective gives us this sort of a regularized this minimization process. And for me, this is one of the, the, the one of the coolest things about the SVM. Every there is no arbitrary choice here. Everything goes back to a theoretically motivated definition that you can trace back all the way to learning theory. Um, which is one of the reasons why support vector machines. In fact, there's more actually, which we may not be able to cover. It's mathematically a clean framework in which you can actually prove things. Um, which very quickly we will uh, abandon that idea once we come to deep learning, the need for proving things. Uh, but at least when we, as long as we are in uh, this world, support vector machines have this nice property. Yes. So a lower C here, right? <coughs> uh, what the lower C, let's kind of uh, uh, go through, interpret that. If, let's say you pick a lower C, that means in this objective, so I'm going to write, I simplify this by calling this is the regularizer of W plus C times the loss of W. If C is low, that means in this sum, the loss plays a less important role, right? Which means, even if the loss was big, 
it would contribute less to the sum. Which means it's okay if the classifier misclassifies points, it's not going to matter much. Which could lead, on one hand, to uh, over generalization or actually underfitting because it's essentially ignoring data points. It's saying, yeah, the loss is big because of all these examples, but that's okay. So the if C is large, that means we believe we uh, want we favor general we favor underfitting or over generalization or just generalization. If C is larger, we want to fit the data. And you would want to fit the data more in the case where your data <coughs> is close to linearly separate. That's right. And the point that uh, maybe I should have mentioned is we never know up front whether our data set is linearly separable or not. So we just find C using cross validation and uh, find the best ones, whatever works. Okay, these are all good questions. I want you to kind of revisit this whole line of argument to kind of, you should be able to derive this stuff, most of it. I mean, everything that we derived in class, uh, and be able to convince yourself what the, uh, why minimizing the norm of W is a good idea. And this is like a somewhat lengthy argument that uh, you, you should be able to try to kind of reconstruct on your own. And then from here you go to, you know, Lax and uh, in class. And so on. I'll post it, uh, I'll post this on the class website, you don't have to take probably update a slide and uh, add this information. Okay, so <clears throat> now what I have done so far is uh, uh, I have set up optimization problems. I keep saying we have an optimization problem and somebody else will solve it. What we are going to do now is uh, we, we are going to become that somebody else. We are going to try to solve that optimization problem and I am going to introduce or reacquaint you with uh, what might be the most common uh, learning algorithm, not just for support vector machines, but across other uh, uh, classifiers as well, namely stochastic gradient descent. So we've seen the idea of learning a linear classifier by maximizing margins. We essentially have reinvented the SVM objective, and now let's try to solve the objective. Uh, so this is the objective that we want to solve. This is the optimization problem we want to solve. And just to give you a sense of what this really means, really what this means is we need to search over the space of all possible real value vectors, real <coughs> vectors in three dimensions, and find the one that minimizes the loss. Um, if we are not particularly clever about it, we will kind of run into infinities because there are infinite such vectors. Thankfully, we will be able to solve this optimization problem uh, more uh, using a gradient based method. So, this is a list of things I'm going to try to cover, and definitely not in the next 20 minutes. Um, it turns out that the optimization problem that we set up is a particularly nice one from the uh, solving point of view because it's a convex function, and convex functions are good for uh, optimization. And so we look at what they are, what convex functions are. And then I'll uh, bring back uh, gradient descent and talk about uh, or Bring, bring, uh, bring back so stochastic <coughs> gradient descent and kind of instantiate stochastic gradient descent for SVMs. Um, we see a picture that tells you what, like the proof by pictures of why stochastic gradient descent might be faster. And the tricky bit in gradient based methods, perhaps the tricky bit, is actually calculating the gradient. Because any algorithm that you have should be able to calculate the gradient. It turns out uh, for SVM, the gradient has one more bit of an annoyance, namely it is not a differentiable function in all places because max, it has a max. Max is not differentiable, which means we have to uh, encounter another new concept called subgradients. And finally, you will put all of these together and create this algorithm called stochastic subgradient descent for this SVM object. When we are done, when we see the algorithm, I'm going to tell you the punchline right away. We'll end up with an algorithm, learning algorithm that looks unbelievably similar to the Poisson algorithm. Um, in fact, like I said in the live, somewhere in the last lecture, it might be maybe about 12 characters different. Mm -hmm. um, 
So those of you who wrote the perceptron code for homework 2, you're in luck because uh, you, you can essentially take that, rename the file, call it SVM, and make some changes. <laughs> those of you who didn't write SVM for homework 2, uh, sorry, perceptron for homework 2, uh, you probably, you, this is your chance to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and, all right, so let's uh, look at convex functions and uh, why convex functions are useful. The starting point of the story is that this function is convex in W. Now, uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people have encountered convexity before this class? I may have asked this before. Not everyone, that's good because uh, I'm going to give you a crash course. Uh, those of you who have seen it before, uh, the word recall is important for the rest of you introducing convex functions. First, let's get the uncomfortable bit out of the way, the definition. A, fun a function, f, uh, is, con is called convex um, if for every uh, u and v in the domain of the function, and for any lambda that's between, minus one and, uh, between 0 and 1, we have a, a, a certain property, which is, imagine that you have two points u and v, something like this. If lambda is between 0 and 1, we can build a convex combination of u and v by saying, I want a little bit of u, and the rest of it should be filled up with v. How much u? I want lambda times u plus 1 minus lambda times v. This is basically, for different values of lambda between 0 and 1, it's every point between u and v in this uh, space. Uh, because this is basically an equation of a line in one dimension. So, if lambda is 0, you basically get the point V. If lambda is 1, you get the point U. This is, all of these are points in the domain of the function, and I can calculate the value of the function. That's F of um, this point in the middle. Let's call it, let's say for the sake of picture, it's this point here. I can calculate the value of the function, and that function, the value of the function is this thing here. It's whatever this now, this value is. A function is convex if the value of the function between u and v, for any point between u and v, is always less than the average value of the function, <coughs> average of the value of uh, function at u and v, the weighted average. So I can compute the value. This point here is f of u. This point here is f of v. So this is here and this is here. And I can weight the value of the function by lambda. So u gets the weighting of lambda, and f of v gets the weighting of 1 minus lambda, I can do the same thing. So a function is convex if, in some sense, the secant, <coughs> that's the secant, right, lies above the value of the function at all points uh, in for all u and v, and for any lambda between 0 and 1. So <coughs> this is just a very complicated way of saying a function is convex if it basically looks like a cup. <laughs> Uh, there is something nice about this definition. So convex functions are essentially the bread and butter of uh, optimization research. Essentially, if you have a convex function, optimization is easy. If you have uh, uh, minimization is easy because you have a global minimum. If you have a uh, concave function, maximization is easy. I have not talked about concave, but from a geometric perspective, what this means really is that every tangent plane lies below the function at any point, no matter where you calculate the tangent, a better, someone who draws better than me would be, uh, I'll never get this. Uh, uh, no matter where you draw the tangent, it's going to be entirely below the function, and then it will never intersect the function anywhere else. So it touches the function at that one point, that's your convex function. Many functions that you know and love are convex. Linear functions are convex. <coughs> of x is x squared is convex. Um, the hinge in particular, this is the hinge, right? Max of zero and something. Hinge, the hinge is convex. You can have convex functions in two dimensions. And there are standard ways of testing whether some function is convex or not. One of them is just use the definition of convexity and, you know, go through this process of proving that the f of lambda f, lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v is always less than lambda f of u plus 1 minus lambda f of v. You need to prove that by, by doing hard work. 
Um, another, uh, uh, probably the more popular way of showing that a function is convex in one dimension is you show that the second de uh, derivative of the function is positive. If, the second, if this is a, <coughs> basically a necessary and sufficient condition for the function being convex, you can test it. You can take the second derivative of f of x is x squared, it's the number 2. So it's possible. If you have vector functions, functions from vectors to real numbers, like this thing here, um, the second derivative is going to be a matrix. There's no, you know, for what is positive for real numbers is positive semi-definite or positive definite for matrices. Uh, some of you may have seen positive definite before. If you have, you know what it means. If not, look it up. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to worry about it right now. So there are standard ways of showing that functions are convex. Um, not all functions are convex. Some functions essentially just reverse the sign of inequality and they are called concave. They are functions that looks like that look like inverted cups. Concave functions are also particularly good for <coughs> maximizing. It's like climbing a hill. Guarantee is that there's only one peak. Um, most functions are neither convex nor concave. And which means that from an optimization point of view, they don't give us anything. Or unless you do some special uh, uh, work. Now, the reason convex functions are interesting is because, um, in general, not just for convex functions, uh, for some value x uh, to be the minimizer of this function, what we need, the necessary condition, is uh, the fact that the gradient of the function at that point should be zero. For convex function, this is both necessary and sufficient. Which means, it gives us a way of discovering the minimum of the function. <laughs> what you do is, you go find a point where the gradient is zero. Or you set up a program that keeps reducing the gradient till you come to a point where you get to where the gradient is zero. And because for convex functions, this is an if and only if condition, we have found the minimum. So for minimizing convex function, gradient should finding any point that has gradient zero, finding the point that has a gradient zero is, uh, is is the is the right thing to do. So this is why convex functions are useful because it automatically lets us uh, transform this problem of discovering this this big sort of problem of discovering the minimizer of the function to a more concrete thing, which is find a point that has a gradient zero, or create an algorithm that constantly keeps reducing the gradient. Um, or uh, taking the point, uh, or taking us to a point where gradient is zero, which is what we'll do, which is what gradient descends us. So, any questions about convexity and convex functions? This is nowhere close to a complete introduction. This is, I call it a crash course, and even that's an embarrassment. This is um, <laughs> basically a teaser uh, for a, probably a semester long class on optimization. But, any questions? Subject to the caveat that I'm not going to take a semester to answer the question. What you need to know really is what's a convex function. And the idea that uh, for convex functions, minimizing is equivalent to finding a point with gradient zero, which basically means we need to use, uh, we need to compute gradients. This will become important even when we come to neural networks. Neural, most modern neural networks are fall in this category, um, but we still use gradient-based methods and hope they work. And they seem to for some reason. So let's go back to SVMs. We want to solve the optimization problem. We want to find the point W that minimizes this thing, and uh, this class of an optimization problem is uh, quadratic optimization because that term there is quadratic. Um, I will leave it as an exercise to you to kind of convince yourself that uh, the function is convex in W. Um, one important thing that you can keep in mind is that adding two convex functions gives you a convex function. And we are adding two things. We are adding many things here because we have a sum here and a sum here. We are adding many things. All you need to show is this term is convex and this term. So I will leave it to you as an exercise to prove that this is convex. For now, take it uh, as a given that this function is convex in W. It's a quadratic optimization problem. Um, 
quadratic optimization problems are especially well studied inside the optimization <laughs> literature and uh, there are techniques that very loosely they are all together they are called quadratic programming um, and they have been used forever well forever for at least 50 years now for solving these kinds of optimization problems and once the SVM objective came into existence it's a fantastic thing because you know we have a quadratic optimization problem and we have this whole community of people who solve quadratic optimization problems, give it to them and let them solve our learning, create a learning algorithm for us. So early attempts at solving uh, the SVM optimization problem relied heavily on methods from quadratic optimization which worked but they tended to be a bit slow and they tended to be unfavorably slow as data sets became larger. And uh, uh, before we knew it, we arrived in this world of big data and they became pointless. So this was roughly where things were um, in uh, maybe early 2000s. We can use gradient descent, but it turns out gradient descent is also very slow. Gradient descent is simply saying you, uh, you initialize this program with the first, with some, any point, uh, any value of w, it doesn't matter what value of w you initialize because because it's a convex function, gradient descent will always find the right answer or it will always find the minimizer and what gradient descent simply does is uh, you just, uh, it's a general strategy for minimizing any convex function. You start with an initial guess, you've seen this slide before. Uh, you start with an initial guess, let's call it w0. Uh, the function we want to minimize, let's call it g of w, is this function. It looks nothing like this curve here, uh, but you know, uh, this is just a cartoon version of it. And uh, at every point, what you do is you compute the value of this function at w, so we have w0. Uh, this line here represents a tangent at that point, and the gradient is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the direction in which the function is growing the fastest, which is essentially in this direction. What you do is you find the direction in which the function grows the fastest and you take a step in the opposite direction. So you take a step in this direction. And you get a new estimate of w which is closer to the minimum. Once again you repeat the process. You basically keep doing this forever. You find the gradient which is again in this direction and you take a step in the direction opposite to w opposite to the gradient, um, that's why it's gradient descent, and you know, it's, uh, you keep doing this and you keep getting uh, closer and closer to the bottom of the function, at some point you get close enough that you call it quits. Um, and that's essentially a stopping criterion that uh, you have to somehow bake into the program. So this is another standard method, this is guaranteed to work. It looks like this, gradient descent for SVM says, you initialize W0 and uh, you basically uh, start a loop that runs forever or until you are happy enough. At each step, you compute the gradient of W. I use the symbol, this is a Greek letter, uh, I, I, I guess it's Greek, it's nabla W, this is a standard symbol for gradient, nabla J. Um, I'll just call it the gradient of J. And then you update the W to get the next value of W. Wt plus 1 is Wt minus, because we are going in the opposite direction of the gradient, minus some step size times the gradient of, w, gradient of uh, j. So you basically take a, a step in the opposite direction of the gradient and you keep going till you are happy and uh, let's not worry about the r right now, r is called the learning rate. It's basically like your learning rate from the pepperon. There are many, many things that you can do with it. So that is gradient descent and this tends to be somewhat slow. Now, the problem with gradient descent is that you need to compute the gradient of this function at every step. That function includes a summation that's as large as your data set. Imagine you have a million examples at every step.